small business Saturday. That's November 30th. We need to know by, I think it's October 28th is the deadline. So if your business is participating in Small Business Saturday or you would just like to put something in those bags that will be handed out on Small Business Saturday, if you'll let myself or Judy know today so we can get y'all down and then get your logo that can go on that shopping map if you're going to participate. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Jobeth. I uh, want everybody to be looking, um, watch for announcements uh, on the awards nominations for 2019. The website, it'll be on Facebook. Uh, <coughs> copies of the criteria and nomination forms are available today. They're at the back of the table in the back of the room. I <coughs> uh, wanted to let everybody know that there's going to be an open house and ribbon cutting at noon on October 26th at the Wellness Center. We'd like everybody to come to that. And um, I think we mentioned this last time that we will have a Christmas parade, uh, the chamber will, and we're going to have a float in the Christmas parade, I mean. So if you want to join in on that, just get one of the board, get with one of the board members and let them know. You're free to join in on that. The date for the Christmas gala is December 17th. Uh, the new uh, location is going to be at New Assembly Church instead of here. So make sure you put that in your calendar. And... Um, does anybody have any announcements they'd like to make before I do the drawings? <coughs> Nobody? <laughs> okay. So our November business in the spotlight is <coughs> Ritatsu. Paul. And our door prize, get your tickets out. It's number 887-126. Get it, Judy? Never pays to be here. <laughs> so, okay, you want it? Judy, back there. <laughs> okay, and right now I'm going to turn the program over to Sarah. She's going to introduce our speaker. <laughs> Hi everyone. So for today's program, we're going to have Commissioner Urban Dimini with the Kentucky Education and Workforce Development Cabinet. Um, he's an advisor and executive director to Secretary Ramsey. He previously served as Commissioner of the Labor Cabinet. He holds an alumni law degree from the University of Louisville and a Master's of Divinity from Southern Seminary in Louisville as well. So please help me welcome him. me here. I think I'm messing up somebody's PowerPoint presentation here. <coughs> greetings from the cabinet, greetings from Secretary Ramsey and uh, the team. Uh, it's good to see some familiar faces. We've uh, judge executive last time in the Owensboro we met and some of your team members. <coughs> it's always fun to uh, <coughs> come back and visit. Uh, with, let's see. Do you mind if I close this? visit uh, <coughs> this area uh, of the state. <coughs> you probably hear my accent does not fit on the Kentucky map, uh, I, uh, but I lived much longer in Kentucky than in my home country where I grew up. It was uh, just recently, 30 years ago, that I uh, left, escaped Romania uh, <coughs> while still under communism. I was one of the lucky ones to get out. So it's, uh, for me, every time I have a chance to go visit uh, counties, cities in, in Kentucky, around the country, I feel it's, it's an incredible privilege. Uh, the, <clears throat> the freedoms, the opportunities that we have in this country, um, whether you are a young person looking uh, at a career or, or towards the sunset of our lives, uh, reflecting back, <clears throat> I, I think it's a gift that we have. Uh, and uh, so I, I'm very cognizant about uh, about uh, this and the opportunity that I have being in this country, being in Kentucky and serving uh, with, with this administration and this cabinet. <clears throat> so when we started four years ago, almost four years ago, uh, Secretary Ramsey uh, asked me, asked a team to focus on the apprenticeship 
uh, particularly the apprenticeship as, you know, as part of the other work we had, because uh, <clears throat> that had something special about uh, the way we could approach conversations uh, across sectors around <clears throat> the state. <clears throat> and uh, I want to share a few statistical numbers, you know, data with you as, as we look at the jobs uh, or the job market, the workforce in general. Um, and then I want to share some, uh, some uh, of the work we've done about apprenticeship. In the meantime, if anybody has any questions, please, <clears throat> please stop me. Some of you are already heard me talk about apprenticeship. Some of you probably know my talking points by heart, right, Jody? Uh, so we work quite a lot uh, together at, at the Job Corps. Uh, <clears throat> but I think it's no secret <clears throat> that whether you are in a rural county in Kentucky or uh, in a city uh, or anywhere else in the United States, as a matter of fact, anywhere else in the world, the workforce uh, is, is a hot topic. Uh, just about a month ago, I went to visit uh, a very good apprenticeship program in Australia. And uh, guess what the hot topic uh, in Australia is? Workforce, skills. Uh, in Europe, <coughs> everywhere you go, the workforce is a huge issue. If you look at, just for fun, <coughs> just look at the unemployment numbers in Spain, uh, or in France, or in Germany. Um, and and the, the skills requirements for particular jobs, it's incredible. One of the recent uh, <coughs> articles on Forbes actually mentioned uh, that if you are just starting out a career, please get used to the idea of having at least two occupations or two qualifications for life. And don't be surprised if you change it two or three more times. Um, <coughs> so we are, we are really living in a, in, a, in a period of time where things are very fluid. So long are the, the gone those days where you started a job <coughs> and uh, you retired from the job. We still had those occupations and a few of those companies, but that's not the norm. As we grew up in, uh, <coughs> in Romania, uh, if, if, uh, if, if any of you have ever read or studied uh, about what communism is like, promise you, you don't want to go there. We don't want socialism. <coughs> it was poverty. <coughs> and it was total control, uh, government control, and a fear-based society. I was, uh, I was blessed to have grown up in a Christian family, and my dad was a diesel mechanic. And uh, <coughs> he, um, he impressed this, uh, this uh, both on me and my two younger brothers, to study, always be hungry for more in information because nobody can take it away from you. What you learned, what you studied, that's yours. And then learn to do something with your hands, because that's how you will earn a living. Again, that's yours. <clears throat> we went very far away. We departed from that uh, as a culture, not only here in the United States, but across the Western world, I believe, where, um, <clears throat> excuse me, success has been defined by, uh, <clears throat> by diplomas, degrees. I have a 19-year-old son, and uh, last year as we visited colleges, it was astonishing to see how many kids who get into college have no idea what they want to do. I'm sure that you all know exactly what you want to do uh, in life. 60, 70, 80 percent of the kids, just, they just want to have the college experience, have no idea what they want to do with life. And the numbers reflect, <coughs> in Kentucky, between 50 and 60,000 high school kids graduate every year, and you probably heard these numbers before. About 60% of those kids go to college, which is about 35, 36,000. Of that, 35, 36,000, less than 20% graduate college. And if you look at the numbers of how many of those who graduated college <coughs> get a good paying job and then spend 20 years paying off their college de uh, debt, it's astonishing. Now, the secretary says, I say the same. I, I have nothing against college. I have two or three degrees, three degrees myself. And I recall oftentimes <coughs> among my professors' comments as we graduated. We had the cheese and the diploma walking out, and th this professor told us, you better have the skills and the backbone to carry, to carry that degree. 
and I, I never forget that. Um, by the way, as I was going through law school in Louisville, I worked full time as a Mercedes technician at Taffa Motors. And I like to submit to you, 20 years ago as a technician, a Mercedes technician, I made more money than I make now as a commissioner. Right? <clears throat> That's just a side point. So, uh, my father's uh, em uh, encouragement, you know, at, at that age it was not really encouragement, it was we were obligated to, do, uh, to learn things. Paid off, really, paid off. Why am I sharing this with you? As we began to really look at the apprenticeships three or four years ago, <coughs> uh, I, we looked at a way, uh, we looked at the apprenticeship concept in a way to rebrand it. After 40, 50, 60, 80 years, the apprenticeship model has really primarily been used by the building trades very well, <coughs> might I do. If you want to call a carpenter or a plumber or electrician to your house, but I hope that somebody who's been an apprentice uh, comes to your house and fixes uh, what you need to get done. So we began to really <coughs> rethink the apprenticeship notion and uh, <coughs> peel away perceptions or restrictions, if you will, and pitch the apprenticeship model to the employers as their own recruiting, training, and retention program. <coughs> and one of the first feedback, a series of feedback that we got from employers that we're not interested in the apprenticeship because that's a federal or a state program. We don't want the federal government or state government in our backyard or in our office. That was a <coughs> misconception number one. The apprenticeship is not a state or federal program. The apprenticeship is each employer's own recruiting, training, and retention program. And it's a voluntary participation. If a company wants to register with the state, and extend that benefit recognition to its employees, they can do it. If they choose not to, they can choose not to uh, register. But why would you not want to extend national reciprocity or recognition to your employees once you, once you have offered this program? <coughs> so we began to really uh, travel the state and, and, and talk about apprenticeship. Three years ago, <coughs> we had the first summit, apprenticeship summit, and uh, the, the commitment or, or the idea was to really s scale or pitch this concept, this model to employers across all sectors, with primary focus on the five major sectors, pathways that also uh, is also recognized in our school districts. By the way, the fastest growing sectors in Kentucky include manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, uh, IT and business, obviously the trades, <coughs> healthcare, and transportation and logistics. Uh, and uh, the anticipated growth in the next six, eight years in Kentucky will include uh, primarily manufacturing-related and healthcare-related jobs. Assemblers, machinists, mechanics, engineers, managers. Trades as well, but primarily healthcare. <coughs> so <coughs> we began to really approach one company at a time uh, and we had, we started out with about 120 sponsors. Currently, we have about 285 sponsors in Kentucky, by roughly about 4,000 apprentices. And we have 148 different occupations registered uh, currently in Kentucky. <coughs> um, <coughs> but if you look at the numbers, in terms of uh, the job opening openings across the state, Four or five thousand apprentices are not even sufficient to, uh, to start a, a good conversation. Right now, we have last week. I think the report came out: 128,000 open jobs. Now, that's different from a rural county to the uh, to the other areas, but in the aggregate around the state, we have about 128,000 <coughs> open jobs. And the primary reason for these jobs uh, is uh, the mismatched skills. Number one. Number two, low pay. Kentucky oftentimes is really looked at <coughs> Western Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky, Louisville in the context of the national or international business uh, as a low paying, uh, low cost of living area. And sometimes some companies are not the best fit for the apprenticeship. Uh, I don't know how many times I've visited companies, <coughs> not only in the rural areas, but in the cities, you know, close to the uh, cities as well, 
where you know advanced manufacturing, for instance, without naming any company, wants to attract and retain uh, good employees for eleven dollars an hour. Good luck. You go to McDonald's and you get thirteen dollars fifty cents, or Chick Fil A and you get fourteen dollars an hour. So there are a number of dynamics and issues <clears throat> that we face, but generally. Uh, the businesses, employers, public-private sector employers began to pay attention to the apprenticeship conversation. Why? Because number one issue that every company faces is the human capital development. Workforce. So what is registered apprenticeship really <coughs> in, in this context? As I mentioned before, the registered apprenticeship from the employer's perspective is a recruiting, training, and retention program you have an opportunity to step into uh, <clears throat> the workforce development arena and create your own program. So when we talk to a company, the conversation always begins <coughs> with what, what's your need, what occupations you need, and how many of those uh, openings you, do you forecast in the next few years. And create a program, a standard for you that includes educational components and also on-the-job training. Components. Let me ask you a question. How many of you studied a second language <coughs> in school? Great. How many speak that language? Hands up? A little bit. <coughs> so that's what's happening really with our skills. A lot of our kids learn about skills and jobs in school. But when they have to go to work, they don't know how to do it. So the apprenticeship offers an opportunity for the employers to step into this arena and start growing their own, right? From a student's perspective, <coughs> an apprenticeship is a great opportunity to integrate that knowledge acquisition, the book knowledge, with knowledge application. We have a university <coughs> in Eastern Kentucky, Moorhead State University, that has a NASA program, has a NASA engineering, uh, space engineering program, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't think, you know, based on the comments from the, the dean that leads this uh, program, they don't have a pro uh, problem attracting students with highest ACT scores. They got a problem with the high ACT score students knowing how to use a Phillips or a flathead screwdriver. <laughs> Yet they want to be engineers. <coughs> so <clears throat> what we're trying to do with the apprenticeship is really to overlap education and work, uh, the, uh, the employment. Employers, public private sector employers, and education has to have a much closer partnership <coughs> and relationship. So uh, another way to look at it from a public sector perspective as, a, as an area, and we talked about this at the grad meetings, how do we bring a, a region together, right? And identify a series of companies, a series of sectors, and lock in a few or higher or lower number of job commitments, training commitments, and start teaching our kids some fundamental skill sets. Have you ever heard comments about soft skills? What does that mean? Any, anyone? What does soft skills really mean to you? Anyone? Help me out. Work ethic. Work ethic. Work ethic. Show up on time, right? He's on the phone. Yeah. How do you think the best way to teach these, uh, these skill sets uh, to kids? Kids, adults, you think that just kids have problems with work ethic? <clears throat> By way of in integrating work and education, so the apprenticeship is really, it's not a silver bullet. Just uh, uh, as we were enjoying lunch, by the way, thank you for lunch, we briefly mentioned <clears throat> that there's no magic solution to the workforce issues, to, to uh, economic development. But we have to be systematic, I think, about it and uh, have some long-term goals. From the workforce component side, I don't think it's possible to shortchange uh, and ignore the fundamental skills development. Let me share a couple of <coughs> examples with you. <coughs> In one of the counties, we registered one of the school districts, uh, the school district as an apprentice sponsor. And this district actually started to offer apprenticeship program for kids that have an interest in business to run the hot dog stand during the football season, to learn how to run a small business. If you cannot profitably run a hot dog stand, you should not have no business uh, running a business, right? You should probably do something else. 
Uh, <clears throat> we have another uh, apprenticeship program. A judge executive's office offers a, apprenticeship programs for kids who want to do uh, public service or law, law or uh, entrepreneurship. It's a fantastic way to segue into the professional world while you're in high school. Uh, <clears throat> one of uh, our electrical contractors in Northern Kentucky signed an agreement <laughs> with um, Northern Kentucky University to offer building project management degree credits for their apprentices. So we, we have the opportunity to really look at a business and anything from somebody who answers the phones to HR, to your welders, to your accountants, every skill is app apprenticeable. And <clears throat> from our office, from my office's perspective, and uh, from the secretary's office, what we are asking the businesses, the, 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 the employer sectors, is consider testing out this model. <coughs> May that be in a rural area or <coughs> in an urban area. If you start out with one or two employers, that's fine. We began last year uh, testing out the insurance market. We have Independent Insurance Association agreed uh, to test this model out. Every county has insurance agencies, right? Uh, insurance uh, agent. So we want to cre create a pipeline out of our high school for our kids into this sector. Learn a skill set. If you want to stay as an insurance adjuster for the rest of your life, it's a good career. If you want to go to law, you'll learn business, you already have a skill set. If you want to be a welder, you already have an, a one or two year of employment experience with an insurance agency. Looking at how do we expect the, uh, expand this into banking and securities. Healthcare is exploding. Every community has healthcare needs. So one of the new, not really an initiative, but a formalized program that we began to look at and actually um, <coughs> scale is called Kentucky Technical. About a year and a half ago, we applied for a grant from, uh, to the D Department of Education. And uh, we pitched this model to where we, we create a partnership uh, that includes the business, K-12, community college, and local communities. Um, uh, community organizations, nonprofits, as needed. And based on the business need and capacity to mentor and hire, we create a cohort out of high school. The first one is starting out of Hazard, Perry County, with four or five healthcare organizations. Pike County made a commitment to launch something, and Northern Kentucky, and also Lexington, is looking at uh, doing something. So if, you know, if I look at a few years down the road, uh, in this region, the rural counties, uh, this, is, this is a possible solution where we, we come together as chambers, as grad, as, uh, as community organizations and, and focus on a sector, may that be healthcare or manufacturing, and, <clears throat> and pay attention to what the employer's needs are and try to create this partnership where one of the commodities that we can highlight out of this area is the skilled workforce. In, in any discussion with, uh, within the context of economic development, the skilled workforce is uh, probably, even in this area, is a high, high priority, right? If we can sell and market highly skilled workforce, the price negotiation is going to be different than if you sell uh, a workforce that uh, still needs to be skilled. Number one. Number two, if we have the capacity as a region, may that be a rural or urban area, that can adopt to the current need and crank out skilled workforce. That's a commodity. And these are not my uh, wisdoms. We looked at this model. <coughs> uh, one of the IT companies started this uh, um, model. They called it P-TECH in New York, a couple of really low-performing schools districts where high school graduation was below 20%. And after six or seven years, associate's degree completion with a focus on IT is almost 80%. <coughs> so this K Kentucky technical model <coughs> is 9 to 12 plus 2, or 9 to 12 plus 4, depending on the employer's needs. So that's another initiative that we are focusing on. But I want to revert back to the, uh, to the apprenticeship and, and the need for the employers to partner. <coughs> um, without employers, there are no apprenticeships. And uh, without employer participation, there are no tangible hands-on skill sets 
that our kids can really um, uh, learn. A uh, couple more points uh, before I wrap up. Uh, <clears throat> not only private sectors, but the public sector is actually looking at this. Uh, we began conversations with the personal cabinet about three years ago, and now we have five cabinets uh, participating in the in apprenticeship as a way to really look at hiring. Believe it or not, uh, it's a big problem finding skilled employees at the state level too. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, last time uh, I hired somebody at the labor cabinet for one position, it was not a high paying position, I had over 200 applicants from around the state. 80% of them did not have the minimum qualifications, but people are looking for jobs and the skills development is missing. So we have the public sector, the cabinets uh, adopting the model. Just lately, the Kentucky com uh, Community College Systems uh, are really looking at, made a decision to also <coughs> embrace the apprenticeship uh, model. Details uh, will follow. I'm not going to speak on behalf of KCTCS, but it's a huge opportunity really for the region, rural and urban areas, where we will have an organization, educational organization, who will support the apprenticeship. And this is uh, uh, this is important in, in, in the context of how we scale the apprenticeship. As I mentioned, uh, we went from company to company knocking on one door at a time. And some companies have one or two apprentices, other companies have 50 to 100, but it's not really efficient, right? So we are looking at ways to really scale the apprenticeship. And we looked at <coughs> models from Europe, England, Australia, and we, <coughs> we saw that in those countries where they focus on intermediaries, a dedicated entity that represents a sector or a region, there's an economy of scale. And uh, we had a few conversations with, with the GRED office and some of the other regional offices here. How do, we, how do we replicate that here in this region again, if there's a need for that? But uh, <coughs> in terms of uh, intermediaries in Kentucky, we probably have four or five or six uh, new entities in various stages of infancy, representing insurance, healthcare, some manufacturing, <coughs> building trades, you name it. So those are some of the uh, sort of initiatives and attempts that we are trying to put in place uh, as we look for the next uh, few years to address workforce and the skills. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with statistics. You know, you can read that, you heard that all. Uh, <clears throat> one of the commodities, one of the incredible benefits that we have in Kentucky is the quality of people that we have. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and if you look at other countries, you know, a lot of people talk about Germany or <coughs> European countries, how wonderful that is, you know, to, to have the skilled workforce. Not many people talk about the governmental structure the regulations that all of those companies have to face. We have a very different uh, system. Uh, we have a different uh, way we organize our life as society. So there's no particular model that we can take anywhere from anywhere in the world and drop it into Kentucky and expect it to work. Our commitment <coughs> with the secretary and uh, the governor's team is to continue uh, working with our local employers, with the school districts, with the parents, to find the best solution for each region. And I intentionally mentioned the parents because we are still, <clears throat> we are still struggling or we, we still see the incredible effect of, uh, and which is okay, which is should, be, should be the way, sh uh, this is the way it should be really, where if a parent does not want the child to learn a skill, but the preference is to go to college, then, uh, <clears throat> then it doesn't matter what happens. <coughs> I didn't, uh, let me clarify that. How do we, how do we approach, how do we reach the parents, the families, to encourage their kids to learn a skill, to do something with their hands? If you go to college, that's great. Young men and women here, I implore you to learn a skill set, whatever that may be, and try to go to college and get out of college without a debt. I promise you it's going to feel good. I still have law school mates. Uh, after 14 years, they are still paying the debt. They still have fifty, eighty, hundred thousand dollars out of a student loan. It's much better. Life is much easier without anchoring yourself to a 20 or 30 year loan and moving forward like that. 
And <clears throat> to that extent, I think the chamber, this region, uh, the community that really cares for its own, it's going to be very important in partnering with us. Uh, again, uh, my message from the Secretary's office is uh, thank you for your support and for working with us. And uh, we are very, uh, we are committed and we are very interested in finding solutions and uh, finding a way to scale apprenticeships in public or private sector um, <clears throat> as, as, uh, as the local needs demand it. So thank you again for having me, and if I can answer any questions, I'd be glad to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jimmy, for taking time out of your day to come and speak to us today. Um, I'd like to thank Slickback Outdoors for their lunch today they provided. Uh, Jobeth, do you want to talk anything about the trunks of trees or anything like that? Oh, yes. Um, if your business would like to participate in Treats on the Trail, which is on Halloween, I believe, I think it's a, like start around 3.30 or 4 that 30 afternoon. 3.30 to 5.30. 3.30 to 5.30, there we go. Um, but if your business would like to participate, you can call City Hall to commit to being one of the booths there. We have a great turnout, several hundred people, not just from our county, but from surrounding counties come to that. And it doesn't take away from your trick-or-treating experience. We're done at 5.30, so you can still go with the kids and have that experience as well. Thank you. And our next meeting will be November 19th. You all have a good day.